Hello, my name is Alex Siles, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about St. Oswald, King of Northumbria, who was J.R.R. Tolkien's inspiration for Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings. Hello and welcome back. I'm really excited to do this episode about Oswald because in so many ways Oswald could be seen as one of the most important, if not the most important, king for establishing Northumbria. Because while his father and his uncle had both created Northumbria through conquest, it's Oswald who really beds it down and creates the kingdom that we would recognise in Anglo-Saxon history. Now, the reason why I say this is because after the death of Edwin, Northumbria is ravaged for two whole years, and then Oswald comes back, defeats his enemies, and then establishes his kingdom. Alongside this as well, Oswald is the patron for Celtic Christianity in Northumbria. He is the one who brings over monks from Iona to Lindisfarne to establish the church there, and then is the patron for a number of other churches established throughout the northeast of England that then really begins what we would see as Anglo-Saxon Christianity and the expansion of that Christianity within other Anglo-Saxon kingdoms as well. So there are many reasons why was Oswald is so interesting, and I'm really looking forward to expanding on those in this episode. So if you've liked what you've heard so far, why don't you subscribe now, because there's plenty more like this on the channel, and I think you'll really enjoy the rest of the episode. So let's get stuck right in and look at Oswald's early life. Oswald starts off as a son of Ethelfrith, who is this, uh, the Twister, this powerful Northumbrian warlord, who's managed to subjugate many of the other kingdoms in the north of what is now England and in southern Scotland. He's incredibly powerful, he's defeated other kings, he's a warlord, and he's married to Oswald's mother, Acca. Now, when he's married to Oswald's mother, Acca, he also has other sons as well. He's got an older brother, Enfrith, and alongside this as well, he's also got younger siblings, the next one in line being Oswy. So we've got this family group here. But as a young prince of Northumbria, he would have grown up travelling around the various capitals of Northumbria with his father. He would have gone to Adgeferin, he would have gone to Bambra, he would have travelled around the various other capitals of the Northumbrian kingdom, and he would have also seen how his father interacted with the sub-kings of Northumbria, how his father was an overlord and would have power and control. He'd understand the Germanic culture of his people, and he understood the way they interacted with their spiritual god, uh, their spiritualism, with their gods, but also alongside this as well, their language, their culture, all of these sort of things, and his responsibility as an ill thing or a prince, one of these important young men in the kingdom who in the future could be king. But he probably would have never expected to inherit. He probably would have thought that his elder brother, Enfith, would have become the next king. In 616, though, his entire world is torn to pieces when his mother informs him that his father has been killed by his uncle and they need to get out the kingdom fast because his uncle is going to come up and is probably going to kill all the rivals to his throne. After all, his father has been chasing his uncle for his entire life. So his uncle has no love for his little nephews or his family. So because of that, it is a pretty dangerous place to be. So because of this, they then move up to the kingdom right up here, Dalatia. Now there are some suggestions that Acca, his mother, may have been related to the kingdom or the kings of Dalatia, and her maternal grandfather may have been one of the kings of Dalatia. If that was so, then as a kin kinsman to the Dalatian royal family, they could actually get protection up here. Whether or not that's the case, we don't know. It's a bit hard to sort of go through and you have to try and figure out the whole sort of king lists and all of that sort of thing, but it's a suggestion by some historians and archaeologists. Nevertheless, the Kingdom of Dalatia decides that the young princes are going to be kept safe under them. Enfrith, though, chooses not to go up to Dalatia. He goes up to Pictland instead and lives amongst the Picts and marries a daughter of the King of the Picts at that time. So that's a difference there. Enfrith, with his more British connections, due to the fact his mother Beba was a British princess and therefore his father had uh, had a relationship with her, he was born from that relationship, chooses instead to go up and live amongst the Picts, whereas the rest of the family goes and lives amongst the Dalatian Scots. Now this is an important time to jump out of the history a wee bit, because Dalatia was actually a colony of Irish Scotiae. 
Now in the late Roman period, the Romans used the word Scotiae just to mean pirates, and they live and work in the Irish Sea, raiding the west coast of Britain and causing all sorts of trouble. And when they call this trouble, eventually in the sort of post-Roman period, the Dalaratians, who live in Ulster and parts of Northern Ireland today, migrate across into the west coast of what is now Scotland, and they form a kingdom between both sides, because it's quicker to move by boat between the two areas than it is to move by land. So you have a kingdom which would have been in the area of Argyll and Brute, Ayrshire, that sort of area, and across in Northern Ireland as well. And they are the Irish Scotii. So when you've got those kingdoms, then young Oswald is now growing up amongst the, um, the Irish Scots and learning their culture as well. So he'd have learned Irish. He would have grown up as a vassal of the kings of Dalatia. He would have joined their war bands and he would have learnt their ways of war, as well as the other Northumbrian refugees who would have been a combination of his mother's retainers from Deria, who would have been, uh, sorry, from the southern part of Northumbria, the Derians, and his father's retainers who had been exiled, the Benicians, so he would have learnt their styles of war, he would have learnt their cultures, their stories, and alongside his Northumbrian culture he would then have also learnt the Irish culture as well, learning their languages, learning their fighting styles, all of that sort of thing. So as he grows up, he then would have joined their war bands, and we have evidence from the Irish annals of him fighting in Ireland on behalf of the Dalatians. So he would have gained experience, and he earns the nickname White Blade. Now, this obviously could even mean uh, there's a number of different uh, reasons that people think he could have been called this. It's possible that he was a great warrior, and so because he's a great warrior, he's able to go into battle, and he's quick with the sword, so his sword is almost like a flash of white light. Some people even suggest it's because he could have been left-handed. And so if he's left-handed, then maybe then the White Blade is a sort of an ironic nickname. Other people suggest other things as well, that it may have been specifically about the sword he was carrying. We just don't know, but he earns the nickname White Blade. And so whereas if you look at the, the sort of Christian sources, we see saintly King Oswald. Whereas actually we've got this ferocious warlord, just as much as his father Ailthif, because he would have learnt experience fighting against the Dumbarton Britons, the Galloway Britons, other Irish tribes, and also the Picts in his growing up. So he's a warrior as well. He earned a reputation. He would have gathered a war band around him and he would have fought for his host, the King of Dalatia, but also on his own behalf as well, gathering experience and being able to reward people in his own war band. Now, he may never have expected to return to his kingdom, but when he's 29 years old, and the really interesting thing about Oswald is we find out that he never marries uh, while he's in the Kingdom of Dalatia. His younger brother Oswe has a relationship with an Irish princess, and this results in an illegitimate son in Northern Ireland, but Oswald doesn't, which is a really interesting thing. So maybe Oswald was holding out. Maybe Oswald was thinking, well, I'll wait until I'm the king of Northumbria again. Maybe he was plotting and planning his own attack against his uncle Edwin. We don't necessarily know, but history has a way of playing out in a different way. So what happens with Edwin is that he gets killed by his um, stepbrother, Cadwalla. Cadwalla is the king of Gwened, Northern Wales, and when he's the king of Northern Wales, this causes for the events that would cause Oswald to come across into Northumbria. Enfrith initially puts his claim in for Northumbria. So he comes down from Pictland, and it says that he recants from Christianity and becomes a pagan king, and he then goes and tries to make a peace deal with Cadwalla. Cadwalla kills him, and so when he's killed, this then means that now Oswald is the next in line. And this leads up to what we'd call the Battle for Heavensfield. So why don't we have a look at that now? This right here is the cross that stands at Heavensfield today, which isn't far from Hexham in Northumberland. The Battle of Heavensfield is caused by the death of Ianfrith. Because of the fact that Oswald now can go to his lord, the king of Dalata, and says that he now wants to take his troops and attack and try and reclaim Northumbria. Now, the king of Dalatia would probably have looked at this and gone, well, actually, to have an ally to myself, who is a king of Northumbria, who can like be an ally and help protect me against my enemies, is a positive thing. And my investment into this family as being their protector, their host, is now going to pay off. So because of that, he is given his blessing, the monks from Iona give him his blessing, and then he probably forms his war band. And his war band is probably formed from a combination of Dalatians, a combination of Picts who have been driven out of their kingdoms, uh, Northumbrian exiles, and alongside this as well, you would have also had Irish folk from across the mainland Ireland and Britons as well. 
So it's possible that Oswald would have been multilingual, also speaking Brythonic or Old Welsh, as well as Irish and the Germanic Anglo-Saxon language. But he gathers his troops, he takes them from Daratia, probably by boat, to the Solway Firth, and then goes along the line of what was Hadrian's Wall to the point where they come here to Heavensfield. Now, they think that Cadwalla was camped nearby, and when he was camped nearby, what Oswald does is he does a night attack, or he attacks in the early morning dawn. Now, just before the Battle of Heavensfield, Oswald is camping, he goes to sleep, and when he goes to sleep, he sees St. Columba in a dream. And St. Columba tells him to raise a cross on the battlefield, and then he will be assured victory as long as he is loyal to the god of St. Columba. Now, there's a lot of discussion about this. Is this a similar thing? Because we know that uh, Constantine, or the Roman Emperor, he, before the Battle of the Malavian Bridge, also, according to one of the Christian sources, says that he had a vision from God to raise a cross, and then when he raises the cross, he is given victory, because he's told to put the chairo, which is a Christian symbol, onto the shields of his troops, and this will assure him victory. So are we seeing a similar thing where the, the Christian missionaries to Oswald have told him about the great emperor of Rome and this has then influenced his dreams or is this a later Christian story that's put onto it or is it a literal miracle? I'll let you guys decide in the comments below if you think it's one of those for you, if it's political, if it's an influence and it's like an influence in his psyche that causes like for almost a suggestion for him to do this, or if it's an actual miracle from God sending St. Columba to his dreams to tell him to do it. I'll let you decide that. But nevertheless, Oswald raises a cross at Heavensfield, and we know even in Bede's day, people would go there and take splinters out of it as holy relics, and they'd put it in water to get holy water. So it was apparently quite badly damaged by Bede's day because of the number of pilgrims who would go and take off slivers or splinters of wood from the cross. But nevertheless, Oswald raises a cross, and he digs a hole and lifts it in himself, a great sign of his own commitment to the Christian faith. So he leads a dawn assault on Cadwalla's forces. Now Cadwalla is the king of Gwened in northern Wales. He defeats him, but Cadwalla is also allied with Penda, king of Mercia, the king of the Midlands. So when he's allied with King Penda of Mercia, what happens is he defeats Penda's armies and Penda flees out. And so Oswald is now able to take back from the Mercians the kingdom of Lindsay. Now, when he takes the Kingdom of Lindsay, that's one-day Lincolnshire, and that had a strong Anglian settlement as well, so that's brought under Northumbrian control again. On top of this as well, he's then able to do a campaign to the north, and he attacks the Gogodden. He is then able to take the Kingdom of Gogodden, which is the area of Monday Lothian and Edinburgh, and bring it inside of Northumbria. So he's able to secure his borders and make himself into a warlord, and he's also got an alliance with the King of Dalati as well. So because of that, the main enemies, so obviously Cadwalla of the Northern Welsh, Penda of the Mercians, and a number of other foes as well, are now subdued, and he's able to control his kingdom. He's then able to establish Lindisfarne under St. Aidan, and then you start seeing the Christianity expanding out from there, and he establishes monasteries. And interestingly enough, initially Aidan can't speak uh, the Germanic language, so wherever Oswald goes, he translates Aidan. Now this would have had a huge power to the Northumbrian people, because in the Anglo-Saxon context, the king was the representative of the gods. So if the king is the representative of the gods, and you have the king standing there, and he's telling you about his new god, this Christ, and he's got this Irish monk who's speaking their language you can't understand, but he's telling it and translating it and telling you about grace and heaven and Christ, it would have been a powerful experience for the Anglo-Saxons, and then many of them would have converted to Christianity as well. And you see expansion of monasteries, churches, and all of that across Northumbria. Because of his Christianity as well, he becomes godfather to King Singus of uh, Wessex. And so down on the south coast of Britain, in the area of uh, Devon and Cornwall and the south coast, there you have the kingdom of Wessex. And so what he does there is by becoming the godfather of King Sindus of Wessex and marrying his daughter, Kinneberger, then he has an ally to the south. And that ally to the south means that then they can pincer in Mercia and control Mercia as well a bit more. So there's that political reasoning. So him and Kinneberger have a son, Uthelwald, who later on would become the king of Deria, but we'll talk about him at a later point. And so you start seeing Oswald's real power. 
Now this is again where we come back in to Lord of the Rings and his similarity to Aragorn. And the reason why that Tolkien used him was because Oswald, even though he establishes his kingdom, he brings back Northumbrian power and he does all of these amazing things, he's only king of Northumbria for eight years. And in 642, he is doing an assault down into Mercia. And at Masselfield, near Oswey, in, modern day, in the modern-day Midlands, he is ambushed by King Penda of Mercia. Now, when he's ambushed by King Penda of Mercia, we believe that he was possibly trying to support a usurper within Mercia, a guy called Eor. And Eor may have been um, a relation of Penda, who he was trying to put on the throne of Mercia to fully control Mercia as a sub-kingdom, as a vassal kingdom. But Penda manages to ambush him and kills him in battle. And we'll have a look now at how this affects Oswald's saintly reputation. So Oswald is ambushed by Penda at the Battle of Mercerfield near modern-day Oswersi. Now when he's ambushed, he is killed in battle and surrounded. And one of the accounts is that he turns, uh, apparently looks to God and says, God protect my men as they're cut down around him. And when they're cut down around him, Penda, in a very much Germanic pagan sort of way, decides to dismember Oswald's body. And when he dismembers Oswald's body, you can see in this image here a representation of it that was actually in a penguin children's book, which I thought was uh, really interesting. And I, I kind of love the old um, penguin books for this reason, because I don't think a modern history book would be as graphic as this is. But um, all the same, what he does is he cuts off Oswald's arms and legs and his body and he cuts off his head and puts them on stakes on the battlefield. And there's a number of different sort of uh, miracles associated with this. So for instance, where apparently a, um, an eagle picked up Oswald's arm and dropped it on the ground, a holy wealth came up. But his brother Oswe rides down, reclaims his brother's body and brings it back up to Bambra, where Oswald's arms were kept in silver cases, uh, was kept in a silver case, which you can see in my Bambra videos, right up until the 1100s when they were stolen by a monk from Peterborough who took them down there and they remained in Peterborough right up until the English Civil War when they disappeared during the sacking of a church. So if you ever go to Peterborough and you see a pair of arms lying around, they could be Oswald's, please return to Bambra Castle. His head was initially buried with St. Aidan when St. Aidan passed away. And so when it was buried with St. Aidan, it was put inside of St. Aidan's coffin. And then later on, when the, uh, the Celtic Christians at Lindisfarne had a disagreement with the new Roman Catholic way of doing Christianity in the Northeast, his head was transferred into the coffin of St. Uh, Cuthbert. And it remained there right the way through. And even today in Durham Cathedral, they believe that Oswald's head is still there because when they exhumed Cuthbert's body in 1820, they found a skull which had a horrendous head trauma to the back of it. And that horrendous head trauma, they reckon was Oswald. And so because of that, we have evidence of Oswald's uh, martyrdom and his body, which may still, uh, part of it is still able to be uh, accessed if you wanted to exhume St. Cuthbert in the modern day and age. But there's an interesting one for you nevertheless. Now, during the reign of his brother Oswe, um, his cult never really developed strongly in Northumbria. There's very good reason for this as well, because if you're the king's brother, you don't want to be overshadowed by your dead brother. And so because that is only after Oswe, later Northumbrian kings, venerate Oswald more. His cult, though, did develop strongly in Netherlands, Germany and Switzerland, as Anglo-Saxon missionaries would then take it across into the continent as they were converting their Germanic cousins. So Oswald's uh, cult continued, and in fact he has a number of heads apparently in Germany uh, which have been in various churches, and apparently the head of St. Oswald is in a number of different churches, though I would personally think the one in Durham Cathedral is most likely to be uh, the actual Oswald himself. Now when you look at Oswald, as we've discussed in this, he's got so many different facets. He is not just the saintly king who established Celtic Christianity in the Kingdom of Northumbria, but he's also the king who was a warlord, just like his father and just like many kings to follow him. He was trained in battle amongst the Dalatian Scots. He fought in Ireland, in modern day Scotland and in Northern England. He defeated his enemies, established his kingdom, and alongside that as well, made other kingdoms such as Lindsay, modern-day Lincolnshire, and also Lothian or Gogodin fall under his power and his control. 
and his kingdom was powerful during his lifetime. And after his death, his brother then proceeded to then establish it further. But it's a very interesting one because Oswald today, with his churches throughout the whole of Northumberland, County Durham and in mainland Europe, still has an effect on our modern mindset of the Anglo-Saxon people. And that's why I'd argue that he's actually one of the most important Northumbrian kings. So I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, that you've learned something and that you've really enjoyed learning about Anglo-Saxon England and St Oswald today. If you didn't subscribe at the start, why not you subscribe now? Share the video with your friends and if you would like to support me further, I do also have a Patreon. And I'm a tour guide, so if you would like to see more of the northeast of England and learn its stories, you can always book a tour of me at www.islestours.co.uk. In the meantime though, stay safe and well and thank you so much for watching and I look forward to you joining me in another video in the near future.